Hi, I'm Rob Seltzer, the Aortic Chef. And I'm Mindy Seltzer, the Aortic Dietitian. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Aortic, Aortic Kitchen, Kitchen, Volume 4. Today's Aortic Kitchen, we're going to move on from our previous salads and salad dressings and soups uh, and, and knife skills. We're now going to move into cooking grains and nuts and seeds, which are real important parts of the aortic diet. Uh, all three uh, provide all sorts of nutrients and good things for aortic health are uh, both as long as they're whole grains, nuts, and, and the seeds have lots of vitamins and nutrients. So we're going to move on and talk about those. And then at the end, I'm going to have a little bonus feature and we're, I'm going to demonstrate how to break down a, a chicken because you can save a lot of money. Chicken is the meat of choice, fish and chicken in the aortic diet and the Mediterranean diet. And uh, it's, it's, it saves a lot of money if you want to, you can buy a whole chicken and then break it down yourselves. It's a lot more money expensive to buy just chicken breast or buy just chicken legs or whatever. And we can utilize the whole chicken this way. We can make stock with the leftover parts and everything. So we'll do a quickie on how to break down a chicken. So let's talk about grains for a second. Uh, what really are grains? Now grains include, uh, they're anything, they're the seeds. Well, let me back up a little bit. Um, grains and nuts and seeds, they're actually all seeds. They're all part of the seed family. Uh, not all grains are, are seeds and not all nuts. Nuts are all part of the seed family. Not all seeds are nuts, but all nuts are seeds. So, and grains are also seeds because they're the, uh, the seed is something that's encased in the soft outer coating. And when it falls to the ground, it has all the nourishment it needs in order to uh, start growing and uh, to start a new plant. Where a nut, you know, has that hard shell and a dozen nuts, there's a seed inside the hard shell. So when it falls, it has to deteriorate first and break down because it doesn't open on its own. And then the uh, seed can germinate and start a new, typically a new tree because most nuts come from trees. So grains, grains come from a variety of grass. They're the seeds of what we call cereal grasses, uh, which makes a lot of sense because most of the grains that we uh, utilize uh, can be, at one point, can be a cereal. So they are the cereal grasses. Now, these things include wheat, rice, corn, barley, oats, kamut, spelt, teff, rye, millet, millet farro, frika. It really is a grain. Sorghum and, and, even, and even wild rice. Okay, all right. You got to say something. I got there. to say something. I yeah, can't be quiet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, our, our little one. He's got to get in the show every Somehow, time. Somehow, some way. We forgot to give him his dinner, so he's over there whining at us. Oh my goodness, he's starving. He's starving. So let's get back to the grains. So wheat, rice, corn, barley. They're all really good for us. Uh, especially when we eat them in their whole natural state. That's what you, you read about in the diets, in the Mediterranean diet and other diets, and you just uh, everywhere about eating whole grains. Now, what does that mean? Now, whole grains uh, and the seeds are pretty much, Mother Nature is pretty amazing. Uh, throughout nature, you'll find that everything, you know, from eggs and seeds and all, all look pretty much the same. There's uh, four basic parts to a seed, okay? Now, I'm gonna talk about this, but I do have to mention uh, that I will be posting later this week more detailed information on all of this about seeds and nuts and grains on the aortichope.org blog. So you'll go to aortichope.org, click on blog, and then you'll see the post from the aortic chef, <laughs> chef the aortic chef, all about uh, grains, nuts, and seeds. Then including as well, there'll be attached recipes for things that we do tonight and some other ideas for you uh, to, to utilize at home. So uh, back to the seed and even the nut. 
So there's four basic parts. The outer part, the hull or the husk, right? That's that hard part that we, that we, in, the, in the whole grain, we don't eat the husk. The husk is cleaned off, it's pretty inedible. It, it would be like the, uh, when you buy an ear of corn, which is a grain, typically, uh, it would be like the outer the green parts, you know, that you tear off of the, of the corn before when you, when you shuck the corn. Uh, that we don't, we don't eat that except for we do use it in cooking uh, to wrap things up in, but, uh, but otherwise we don't eat that. So that's, that's the husk. Then there is the bran. Now the bran is the, if, uh, a good example for you would be like on a peanut. You ever eat red skin peanuts? Now peanuts are not part of this family. They're actually a legume. They grow on the ground. Uh, so they're part of that last week when we talk about lentils and such, but they're very similar in the sense that when you buy red, uh, red skin peanuts and they have a little paper on the outside, that's the bran. So uh, wheat, the same thing. If you get a whole wheat kernel, it has a little brown, a layer of almost like paper, and that is the bran. That has, that's where all the fiber is, a lot of fiber. And that's very, very healthy for us. Uh, because that's, you know, that's the, uh, the colon broom. That's the stuff we want to eat. That's indigestible fibers and it helps our food move through our uh, digestive system. Then we have the, the majority of the seed is what's called the endosperm. And that's where we get in wheat, like the white flour. Uh, that's the starchy part of it, the high carb, all carb part. Uh, that's actually the food for, uh, if we compare this to an egg or human, it would be to the embryo, right? When we have an egg, the yolk is the embryo, the albumin, the white is the food uh, for the little baby chicken that's going to come out of the egg yolk. Well, same thing with uh, a uh, grain. The endosperm is the food that will feed the, uh, not the embryo in that, uh, but it is the, the germ. Okay, and we call you've heard of wheat germ. Now it's a hard part. Uh, and when you break that down, there is a lot of uh, amount of fiber, but that's also where all the protein is in wheat. Uh, majority of the protein in these grains are contained within the germ. So majority of the, of the grain is the endosperm. And then you have that small little part called the germ. So uh, it works the same throughout all the grains, pretty much all the seeds, nuts, um, everything, eggs, us, you know, it, it's funny. It, 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 nature has used that same model throughout for uh, basically propagating the species. So uh, whole wheat, and when you buy and eat whole grain wheat and not just whole wheat, make sure uh, if something like with bread says whole wheat bread, that just means it's made from all wheat. Doesn't mean that it's got the entire kernel, not whole grain wheat bread, okay? And brown, uh, brown rice, brown rice has the bran on it. Uh, corn, naturally, you eat just the corn, uh, the whole thing, unless, of course, uh, your, uh, there, there is a method to remove the outer part of the corn. You get just the white center. Uh, barley, oats, which look very much the same. We're going to cook with those tonight. Kamut is a, another type of similar to wheat. Spelt is a type of wheat, a cousin. Teff. Uh, that's what if you've ever eaten uh, an Ethiopian restaurant, the bread, the injera bread, that is made from teff. That's a very, that's their major protein source in grain. Rye, you crazy that, millet. Millet's probably the major protein source uh, in the grain grown all throughout Africa. We use it uh, for pretty much for bird seed in the United States, you know, uh, but it is a major source of food uh, in other countries and, and more in the third world, especially in Africa. Pharaoh, that's the ancient wheat grain that the Roman army marched on, they say, uh, in uh, centuries ago, and uh, is very good, gotten very popular today. Frika, now Frika is a real interesting one. Frika is basically green wheat, uh, so it's harvested before it's actually ready to be harvested. It is then roasted and rubbed, and it has a real interesting nutty flavor. And if you ever see Frika in the store, you should buy some and give it a try. It's absolutely delicious. Sorghum, you know, uh, we make molasses with it. It's got a lot of sugars and uh, it's also, uh, you know, good to make, uh, especially some gluten-free things, I think, and wild rice. Wild rice, 
is another, rice is a grass, and wild rice is not a rice, it's actually another type of, of grass. But all of these, all of these cereal grains also can be eaten whole. All of them can be ground into flours as well. Uh, so which where we do consume a lot of them. I'm not gonna work with those today. And um, so, Mindy, you wanna talk about the nuts for a minute? Well, some of the new studies that are going on in nuts right now is they are looking at walnuts and it's, it's because it's got the ALL, the omega threes and ALAs in them. And if you look at a walnut, I never thought about it until I had watched the presentation. If you peel a walnut, it actually looks like a brain. So they're associating the shape of the walnut <laughs> with improving brain function. It's in study right now. Tree nuts, um, when you think of nuts, peanuts are not really a, a nut. Um, they, they're grown in the ground. You have to dig them out, even though they're common allergies. The healthiest nuts are walnuts, almonds, and pecans. They have the most fiber in it. They have the most protein for serving, and you should when you're eating it, maybe 20 almonds is a serving. So don't go crazy and say, oh, I can eat a whole lot of nuts and take a big canister of nuts and eat the whole thing. Still a lot of calories. You wanna make the balance. And sometimes people have a lot of digestive problems. Make sure you chew your nuts well. <laughs> so it doesn't irritate. You really um, said that. I did say that. Okay, keep going. Peanuts, walnuts, cashews, no. Um, so it's really easy to incorporate into a meal to add the protein, like Rob's making <clears throat> the rices. And if you wanted to have it with nuts in it, just chop up a few nuts. You want to put them on salad. It's a good source of protein. Also, all those healthy fats that Mindy was talking about, especially the omega-3s, protein, a lot of vitamins. Uh, uh, the like almonds are really high in, vi in vitamin E, okay? Uh, all of them have magnesium, uh, minerals, and then they're also a good source of fiber. Walnuts, almonds, Brazil nuts, cashew nuts, chestnuts, macadamias, hazelnuts, pecans, my favorite, pistachios, and pine nuts. Um, other things you can do with them is that we've walked in, I didn't need to show you this tonight, is like when you um, cook carrots, uh, just put Toasted pecans on top of those. Uh, do green beans with walnuts or almonds. You've all seen green beans, almondine, green beans, and almonds. So just adding nuts to your hot vegetables is also a really easy way to get them in your diet. Part of the key also is every nut has its own different nutritional spectrum. Okay, their own, they're diverse. So what you want to do really to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to enjoying uh, nuts, you want to mix them. So don't just eat all walnuts, don't just eat all almonds. I mean, you buy that canister of mixed nuts, unsalted, of course, we do, they do sell a lot of those. That's all we buy are the unsalted mixed nuts um, and enjoy those as a group. And you'll be able to get all of the different uh, positive nutrients from them by combining different nuts together. Could you pick up one of those cups with the oil in it? This is yeah. actually not oil, okay. but. Um, this is about, Three ounces, that is a serving of nuts. Basically the palm, if you look, it fits in the palm of my hand. That is a serving. So when you're sitting and watching a game or something and popping handfuls of nuts in your mouth, you're eating a lot of calories. If you need the calories, fantastic. If you wanna keep yourself balanced or you wanna pull back a little bit in your weight, use less nuts. Well, they are they are very filling, so they do talk about them as a use for weight loss because they do sate you because of the large amount of fat. And one of our favorite nuts in this household, more than pecans, be honest. Peanuts. Peanuts. Yes, peanut butter. Peanut in, in the form butter. Of peanut butter, right, of course, we eat a lot of that. <laughs> that was my dinner before we started tonight. All right, so seeds real quick. Uh, again, those have soft, a soft outer uh, shells, they contain all the nutrients to grow the plant, including sesame seeds, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds or pepitas, sunflower, hemp, flax, poppy, and then quinoa. Quinoa is a seed, it's not necessarily a grain. It's not part of the cereal grasses. Uh, it is a different type of plant and amaranth as well. 
It's a beautiful plant if you grow it in your garden. They got beautiful purple flowers, uh, elongated uh, uh, flowers that drop down and, and green and purple uh, leaves. They're gorgeous plants. Uh, I don't understand they're not that hard to grow. But the reason they're not that hard to grow is they will overtake your yard. So you have to check with your local um, extension service and make sure you're allowed to plant it in the area you live in. It may be too invasive. Okay, all right. So th there's a quick rundown on grains, nuts, and seeds. Uh, real important parts of the diet. Now what I'd like to talk about in the next few minutes is how we can use them in cooking, but also, you know, I like to talk about technique because now most of these grains, we can all, we all know how to boil them. We know how to, you know, boil rice, we know how to boil, you know, cook corn, boil it or steam it. Same with barley, we throw it in soup. We make oatmeal for breakfast, we put it in water and boil it. Everything is boilable. That, I don't need to show you the technique for boiling. Water in a pot, bring it to boil, drop the grain in, cook it till it's done. You can try to, you know, you can follow the package directions and, you know, you know wait till all the water is absorbed. Or uh, you can also do the pasta method where you just put a lot of water in and when the, you try it and when the grain is done cooking, drain, strain it, drain off the water and away you go. You do not have to wash your grains. If you look at the packages, they're all fortified with something. And if you usually minerals and vitamins. When you wash it, you wash that off. So you really do not need to wash your grains unless you're buying some weird grain, some foreign place or something that you don't know what's yeah. in it. Well, follow the package directions a lot. Uh, but things like oats and barley, you obviously don't rinse those. But a lot of the minutes talk about the rice is especially like, and if it says enriched on the label, uh, that means it's been, it has vitamins added to it and they're all on the outside. There's like a dust, that's that powder that's on the outside. So if you rinse that away, you've just washed all the vitamins down the drain. So you don't really want to do that. So not some other methods that I'd like to uh, talk about is, and you've all probably had this, is the cooking method. One is pilaf, probably all had rice pilaf, right? Well, you can peel off anything, not just rice. We can peel off wheat, we can peel off barley, uh, ground corn, oats, you can, everything can Pasta. be peeled off. It's just a technique for cooking. And all it is is where you basically quickly uh, saute the grain that you're going to cook. Uh, typically with, if you're adding other vegetables like onions or something, you saute it in a little bit of oil, uh, try to toast it a little bit. Then you add your liquid and then cover it and let it finish cooking. So. I'm going to make a uh, a bulgur pilaf tonight. Now, bulgur is what we make. Uh, we did tabbouleh. That's what you make tabbouleh with, uh, typically, and uh, it's very easily cooked. But uh, it's cracked wheat, so it's broken wheat. Uh, this is basically right here. This is bulgur, and I'm going to pilaf this. And then I'm also going to make. Uh, I have some barley here which looks suspiciously like oatmeal, but it is barley. And that method I'm gonna do is the risotto method, uh, which I'm sure many of you have had a risotto with rice, but also any good starchy grain, you can turn that uh, into a risotto. It's not the same as the rice risotto, but it is still the risotto method. These are methods to cook and a great way to change up your menus, change up your diet. Don't always have to have you know risotto with, with rice or pilaf with rice, because again, uh, a lot of you, I really recommend using brown rice. It's all pretty much what we use in the house. We've switched a long time ago. And I've had great success with it, especially when I peel off it. It cooks and behaves pretty much like normal rice. Uh, but the, uh, you know, white, plain white rice, which a lot of people use, is really not the rice we want to consume. Okay. It's uh, got a little bit too, you know, you don't have that fiber that helps, you know, slow down uh, the digestion and uh, some of the more other nutrients. It, it will raise your glucose levels. Absolutely. Whereas brown rice will not spike as fast. Right. So I'm gonna do that. And then the third thing also, which everybody loves, is granola. And Mindy's gonna make some granola uh, with oatmeal. 
but you can show you how simple it is. I mean, there's no need to buy the, the granola that you buy in the box at the grocery store made by the big cereal companies. I won't mention the names, but you know who they are. Those granolas, mm, they're really tasty, but that's because. The same reason ours was gonna be tasty. The, the key is portions. Right. They're, they use a lot of honey, sugars. sugar, molasses, oils. So they're very, very high calorie. Uh, most of the, well, all of the granolas and granola in general. But if you make it yourself, you can control that a little bit. Mindy does control. She so she kind of flips the amount of oil and honey. So, you know, fat has more calories. So she reduces that a little bit and adds a little more honey. But actually making your own granola and also to your own taste is really simple. So we're going to let her start with that first. And then I'll switch over to the stove and show you how to do the, um, the pilaf and the risotto. So over to your to your stuff my there. Station. Okay, so if you look in the bowl, here's my oatmeal. And then it's regular oats. It's not steel cut oats, it's not quick cooking oats. Make sure it's old fashioned oats. Then I had toasted off some nuts earlier. So this is a mixture of pecans, walnuts, almonds. And then I made some fruits in it. There's cranberry and raisins. You can use dried cherries, you can make it with apricots. I always suggest you put a little bit of the nuts in it if you don't like nuts a lot, because that's going to give you that little bit of extra protein. So I'm going to take my spatula right here, and I'm just going to mix my dry ingredients together. And while I'm doing that, I have three tablespoons of honey and two tablespoons of oil. Most people do it on the stove. I'm extremely lazy. I'm gonna put it in the microwave. Why do you need to put it in the microwave? Because you want it hot and boiling, so the oil and the honey mix together, and it will help coat the vegetables. And there's something in there that doesn't work. I got it, thank you. Okay. Okay, so if you can heat that up. You can either put the cinnamon, I like lots of cinnamon, you can either mix it in with the dry ingredients or put it in after you heated the oil up. So if you could heat that up for, I think I did 45 seconds. Okay, now did you tell me, I wasn't listening as, as closely. Uh, basically, is it equal oats to nuts and, and raisins it is, and such? It is one cup of oats to about a half a cup of the dried fruits, whatever you use, and a half a cup of the nuts. It's almost one to one on the. So you can adjust it however you want. If you want more raisins or nuts and or less nuts or more nuts and less fruits, everything's up for grabs. And that's the fundamentals. If you want it lower calorie, you put less of the dried fruit in it. And I'm putting about a teaspoon of cinnamon because I love cinnamon. Now I make this during the Jewish holidays called Passover, which you heard about because we started the program and I make it with matzah. I crumble up the matzah to the sides of the oatmeal and add the same ingredients to it. And my kids call it crack because once I make it, I make a batch like this and then I have to make it two more times. Here we go. Because it's not enough. All right. So this okay. is was boiling. It actually was right to the top when I pulled it out. Okay. Fizzle it all around. Got it? Hmm? And if you look now, I'm coating that perfectly, but coating it pretty well. One thing you do not want to do is spread it out completely on the pan, because if you like the little clumpies that people always tend to pick out of the package, that's how you get the clumps. If you spread it too thin, you won't get your clumps. You basically just want to moisten everything. Make sure it's all moist. There's nothing hanging out in the bottom. Bring everybody to the party. And then we're going to take, I like using parchment paper. One, it's easy to clean. Just dump it on your pan. Spread it out. And usually you can bake it at 325, 350, depending on your oven. Check it in 15 minutes not as toasty as you want it, cook it a little bit more. And through the magic of television. Right. 
Okay. I'm going to put this in the oven and show you a completed batch. Three, two, one. That was time travels. Now, 30 minutes later. Later. Fast little look out when it's done. And if you look, it's all crunchy, flavorful, That's and a little nice. bit different than I made the other one. And how do you want to keep that? I store it in a jar. Do not put it in a plastic bag. It will get too moist. You need a sealed container. So like a big mason jar? Mason jar or container. even or even the any of the um, you know, plastic containers, plastic containers that have, that have a tight seal. Right. All of those good All things. All those, you want those tight seals on it. Okay. Then, you know, it won't last. Uh, something fell on. Oh, there we go. So. Yeah, it, it doesn't last long enough to go bad. That's all I was going to say. In our house. At least in our house. So um, It's really great if you want to make a yogurt parfait. You can take, sprinkle a little bit of this in the bottom, put yogurt on top, put some fresh fruit like strawberries or blueberries, put another layer of yogurt, and sprinkle this on top, and you have your breakfast. You pay about, you know, five bucks for that in a quick server or in a... Uh, 7 Eleven or Wawa or whatever, they'll charge you five dollars for one of those. You can make it uh, for you know about 50 cents. So, really, really easy. Well, that was great. See how fun and easy that was? We just learned how to make granola. The best part of it is, is that you can, you know, do it yourself and you also get to put in whatever you like. You're not limited to, uh, Things that you may not like, you know, it's all the nuts. For example, most of the recipes I looked at mentioned coconut. A lot of people do not like coconut, so don't add coconut. All right, so I'm going to move to the stove now. And we're going to start with first, I'm going to start the peel off. Okay, so when we focus on the stove, oops, I think I turned the wrong burner on there. There we go. Okay. And so I'm going to, I have a pot here. I'm going to warm that up and I'm going to put some oil in it. Can we pin that, uh, please, Josh? Or if it is, I'm not gonna... Oh, okay. I still got the cheap pan up. But, and okay. uh, while I'm at it, hey, Felicia. Hey, Melissa. Thanks for dropping by. Often. Awesome. Hey, Mel. Hey, Felicia. Nice. Thank you for stopping by. Very much so. All right. So with any peel off, the first thing I mentioned was we're going to saute. So I'm going to add some oil. Not much. It's about maybe a tablespoon in here because I'm going to make about a cup's worth of peel off. Okay. So again, you'll have recipes. I'm going to have charts and all those types of things. But I need enough oil in the pan to be able to saute off my onions plus coat all the grain. Okay, so let that heat up for a second. Make sure that's getting hot, making Mindy very nervous uh, because we're using my double boilers <laughs> right on the stove and she's scared to death. Well, but we'll see. More than anything. So, all right, and I'm going to change this up a little bit. So, I think that's probably getting pretty close to warm. I can drop a little onion in there and see. Yeah, we're getting there just a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're going to sweat, right? We've talked about sweating before. We're going to get the onions to sweat and get clear. So I don't really need that big sizzle in the bottom of the pan when we start this. And we're also going to make the risotto, okay? So I'm actually going to start it. You're not going to see it, but I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to warm up my pan. And then I'm going to put onions in the other one. Then we'll make the switcheroo and I'll bring the, that one into focus in just a minute. Okay. We have a question on what type of olive oil that was. Um, that actually was in that bottle. I have grapeseed oil, but if I was cooking, I would use my pure or my the light of olive oil, which is uh, refined so it doesn't burn up. There's, you know, I, I read another article this week about olive oils and stuff, and this uh, author was going on about, you know, that 
and in fact, I think it was, I think it was Wired, which is part of the New York Times, and that, you know, that is a fallacy that um, you don't ruin olive oil by cooking with it. And I still say they're wrong because, yes, uh, most times you don't get to that over that 350, so you're not necessarily going to burn it. Uh, but, but, and then, yeah, so, uh, but when you do heat it up, I mean, it th doesn't change the, the vitamins and such, but the, the phenols that are in the, the, the good fat in the uh, monosaturated fats contain phenols. And that's what it is that makes it really healthy and really good for you. And those are destroyed by heat. So you really don't want, when you, when you heat it up, when you're cooking, you are going to uh, destroy the, the really the, the extra good property. That's the antioxidant properties of the extra virgin olive oil. So like I say, cook, start off with a neutral oil, whether it's light olive oil or pure is fine. Um, or canola another, oil. You know, yeah, canola, grapeseed. I've got pecan oil over here too, which is a great cooking oil. Um, then when it gets closer to being done, you can add some extra virgin for flavor. It's a condiment. When your spaghetti sauce is done, you know, then stir in some extra virgin olive oil. It'll give it a beautiful gloss, and also you'll still have that extra virgin flavor. I can stir it into my rice or into my, my pilafs or my risotto. Hot. It's got oil in it already. Okay. I'm not going to break it. She's all worried. I'm worried about it. It's going to explode I've in my face. I've had it since we were married. Yeah. Which is 45 years, so. Okay. So I'm just getting that one started so we don't waste time. All right, so you notice these onions are cooking nicely. Back there a little, I can turn that down a little bit. I don't need any color. I just want them to go clear. So they're almost there. And remember that, that's our term for sweating. You know, sometimes, I mean, I love caramelized onions, but there's really just times they have their time and place. And this is not one of them. Now, if you're making um, a pilaf, uh, with other styles, uh, like if you maybe want to add peppers or carrots or uh, mushrooms or things like that, you would add them at this point. I'm also doing this Turkish style uh, because the um, bulgur pilaf is often made, uh, well, is typically made with a tomato product added to it. So I'm going to add a little bit of, we we'll did the risotto or with that. Yeah, we'll do a little bit of the pilaf. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? Tomatoes are good for you any way you eat. Them. Right. So just a little bit of tomato paste in there. We want to cook that as well. You always want to cook your tomato paste. You never want to just throw it in raw. Otherwise, it's bitter. You need to caramelize the internal sugars. So, all right. My onions look good. The tomatoes are good. I'm going to add my bulgur to this one. I have a cup of bulgur. Okay. Pour that in all at once. Now we just want to mix that around along with the, the paste and everything else. You want to get the get it, bulgur coated, coated just like we oil. did with the oatmeal. Yes, yeah, so you want to get it coated with the oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get it coated with the oil. See what happens when you jump in on my, my little thing here? Yes. Confuse me. I so, and I'm also going to want to toast it a little bit, okay? Not too much. I don't want to burn it, but I do want to I kind of start the cooking process, but also toast it. And again, bring out some of that nutty flavor that's already in natural to the vulgar. Okay, turn the front one off. These are just about there. And we're almost ready. So do this for a couple of minutes. Even up to five minutes, okay? But we're not going to do it that long. So we're toasting, toasting, toasting here. And then you're going to add uh, it's two to one when you do bulgur, typically. How do I know it? No, thank you. Okay. Two parts liquid to one part grain. And that's typically the magic number for cooking most grains. Uh, rice, you know, bulgur, most all of them are two to one. So this is vegetable stock, by the way. You can use chicken stock. Uh, you can use any stock that you want. Uh, 
So now what you want to do, stir that up, turn up the heat. Want to bring it to a boil, then I'm going to turn it down and let it simmer and we're going to until it's done cooking. OK, I will. Yes. So, all right, I'm going to turn that to another burner. In a minute, let that warm up. I'm going to switch pots. Bachelor. Nope, I don't need another one. I'm all set. Okay. As soon as that comes to a boil, I'm going to cover it, turn it down, and let it cook. Now, typically pilaf is made in the oven as well as another method. You know, heat is heat. So if you put it in the uh, oven, and uh, you're just, you know, that's just as easy uh, to do. And uh, about a 350 oven with a lid covered or foil, and just let it go until it's done. Usually about with typical rice, about 20 minutes. This might take a little bit longer. So I have a question. Okay. What is paella considered? Paella is basically a fancy pilaf. Okay, because you take all your vegetables, uh, you saute it off in oil, you add your Valenciana rice, which is special rice from Spain. Uh, it's very similar to, to a Boreo rice, which they used to make risotto. I starch. I'll talk about that in my paper um, on the uh, blog, all right? Because there's short grain rice, medium grain rice, and long grain. Short grain rice is the highest starch, long grain is the lowest. And when you're making a risotto, you typically want a lot of starch in order to make that thick, creamy sauce. Now, these uh, barley. barley, I look at it, I want to say oatmeal. I know. Also has um, a lot of nice starch. Now, I'm going to put some mushrooms in this one. Real quick. I can just add my oats, my barley with that. That's not quite the same. Now the barley, we're going to do uh, three to four times the amount of liquid to um, grain with the risotto. And that's because a lot of the liquid, one, uh, evaporates because you do this open, you don't cover it. And uh, secondly, because uh, you're trying to get all this starch out and you want it to bind and, and make this beautiful sauce. So I think we can probably just put a lid on that, Mindy. Yep, and just turn and it down. Let it roll. Can you okay. stir it one more time? No. Okay. If you want. Sweetheart. Uh, you can. <laughs> you really feel like it. Okay, now I'm going to toast this barley. Let it get some color. Yes, I am done with the tomato. You. I gotta keep it. I want to keep it moving. I want to leave it sit too long because the barley is, you know, pretty dry and it's going to uh, toast, you know, like bread. You don't want to leave it too long. It's going to burn. So I just want to get it. You'll see the color change in a second. Hope everybody appreciates our new camera setups. We've been playing around and getting some new equipment and um, this particular camera we have near the stove. Makes it a little bit easier for you to see what's going on. I asked him to knock the wall out, but yeah, can't do it. <laughs> Seven dollars instead of seventy dollars instead of seven thousand, you know, a little bit better. Okay, see we're starting to get some color change on the on the grain in there, I, I can see it. Hopefully you can see little bits of brown. Okay. That is not boiling yet, Mindy. So almost there, almost there. All right. That's looking pretty good. So now like risotto, we want to deglaze our pan with wine. I have some white wine here. Best smell in the world. Wine hits a hot pan. That's a little too much steam for my camera. I'm going to move this. I moved it out of the way for a second. Let that evaporate. Okay. 
And I also wanted to put that wine underneath my nose. If I can't drink it, at least I'll smell it. No. Okay, that's absorbed. That see how quickly that went away. Wine is just there for flavor. We want to absorb it into the, the grain, which it has. Now we're going to start adding our stock. Now you want to have hot stock. And because uh, you don't want to lower the temp and you know stop it from already boiling or being nice and ready to go. Now, so we're going to do it in about three batches. We're at about a third at a time. Okay. Back to my burner. And now this comes the stir, stir, stir thing. The first edition, you definitely want to stir all the time until this uh, reduces and absorbs. You're getting the starch cooking, getting the grain starting to cook and soften with this first edition. But why the stirring? The stirring helps release the starch uh, from the grains, whether it's rice, whether it's barley, okay. Um, oats, quinoa, quinoa risotto is also very good. Remember, quinoa is is it is considered a grain, but it's not a part of it's not a cereal grain. It's just a, it's a seed from another type of plant. But quinoa, you can also make risotto with, uh, you know, a lot of things, everything you can pretty much. What's new with. when we learn pas paesia? Oh, uh, <laughs> poesia. Now you had to ask me. I know. Uh, yeah. P O A C E P O A C E A E, and that's seeds. Yes, another term for seeds, just like oh my gosh. P O A C I E C I E. Oh yeah, it's it's. I had to go to YouTube and have a uh, have it pronounce it for us because I could not figure out that word. We have some feedback. Sort of like pulses. I'm sorry. We have some feedback. Catherine awesome. Norris says a great camera setup. And, thank you, thank you. And Melissa says, is that with real Pyrex pots? Yes, it is. These are the original Pyrex pots from 45 years ago. We got these. That's why I'm using them. That's why I told Mindy we can use them on the stove. They have a flame on the bottom of the of the pot. Saying, you know, we get to we can use them on the stove top. See, I can save you not getting an induction stove top because we wouldn't be able to use them on any. Oh, induction. yeah, yeah. I have my burners outside. I can use these on. Yeah, well, so the, the, actually, the original, the original Pyrex, not the new ones. We had a discussion about that, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about that, uh, Pyrex was a division of Corning, and way back in the early 1900s, uh, Pyrex was developed because the wife of one of the engineers uh, said, "You really should figure out how to make a glass cooking vessel that doesn't." break because that was always the problem so they uh added another mineral of a bromide of some sort to the uh glass uh silicate and it made it uh it expand it does not expand as much when heated so that was why the vessels would always break because when they you know got hot they expanded and then they would explode these do not expand so they they don't break but the newer Pyrex, I do not think, are as um, still oven safe, microwave safe, but not stove. They're not the safe. ones. If you're, if you're old enough, you remember the <clears> commercials. <throat> They'd have a Pyrex uh, pot, uh, and half of it was frozen in a block of ice, and the other half had flames on it. Uh, you know, just to demonstrate, they take it right from the freezer to the oven or to the stove without any problem. And if you have the Pyre Pyrex with the little blue flowers on it. You have to be very careful if you go to a rummage sale or something, because some of them have metal in it. And I had a friend that her mom had given her one of the Pyrex dishes and she just started using microwaves in the early 80s. Well, she put it in a microwave and it went right through the microwave door. Nice. Yeah, because of the metal. <laughs> OK. All right, see, this is almost dry now. I don't want it 100% dry, but so I'm ready for number two of the stock edition. And also we have B. Philip B. saying thanks for dropping by. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I said to him. He said, thank you for putting this together. I do appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So, as you see, this, this is going to keep cooking. And uh, we do the same thing now. Just now we'll let it, let it simmer a little bit, not stir it as much. Let those uh, starches continue to come out. Once this gets down to that next, the same uh, level as the other, no, I don't want to cover it. We don't cover risotto. I was trying to just cover it. It's okay, honey. Steam away. That's okay. That's all right. I'm going to move it away in a minute. Can I have that other little pot, please? The little pot. Little pot. Thank you. All right, so gonna, now you can turn down the peel off. Oh dear. Okay. You got it. I'm got it. The lid's going to blow. It's all right. Leave, leave the steam in, please. No problem. Don't be peeking. I like to peek. No. He can't keep anything secret from me. Yeah. He always tells me. So. You can even see how this liquid's getting starchy as I stir it. You can see the color, how it's getting, uh, you know, it's no longer transparent, coming kind of translucent, kind of creamy looking. I really stir that with some vigor, break down that starch. Okay. You can see how it, it's got, you can see a little bit of thickness on the, Spatula. Get that going. All right. Now, I have a little bit of risotto that I made earlier. And I'm going to show you now. If you want to, if you know, risotto takes some time. If you're making it for company or something you know it's kind of a drag because you need to serve risotto right away typically you should if you make it all the way uh from scratch and don't stop uh you should make it you know and serve it but if you really want to in a lot of restaurants you wonder how the restaurants often they'll tell you you know risotto takes an extra 40 minutes or whatever to cook that's true uh but you can make it ahead and just undercook it a little bit, and then you can put it away. You, you do you do want to put it in the um, holding it for a long time. You want to put it in the fridge, but then just warm it up and then add some stock back to it. What I'm doing here, you know, bring back that creaminess right away. See that? I cheated and threw that in the microwave for a second, which is fine. Microwave is another form of heat. There's wonders of the kitchen. So this one is fully cooked, so I'm just trying to get that cream back. Now, a couple things you can do. I can serve it just like it is. I'm going to throw some chives in there for a little color and flavor. They go well with the mushrooms. And typically, you know, uh, risotto will have uh you know finish with butter lots of butter and cheese now we can leave out the butter we don't need the butter we could pour in a little bit of olive oil for flavor this is the point where you would add the olive oil there we go there's a little teaspoon or so or two and a little bit of parmesan parmigiano cheese parmigiano reggiano not too much it's salty so we want to keep the sodium down Let that melt in. Now, look at that nice creamy shine that we have. See that? There we go. It looks just like risotto, except for it is. Well, actually, I'm going to leave that one on, turn that one off, decide what I got to do here, plate it up. You push that to the I back, will. please. Okay, that's that can go to the stove. All right, I'm going to add 
is working pretty well. I'm going to add the rest of my stock to that. And just let it cook while we do other things. So back to back to the cutting board, Josh. And so I have my nice dish here. I'm going to put a little chive. A little cheesy cheese. Everybody likes cheesy cheese. It's always the good stuff. And then some chives on top of the cheese because they'll stand out. And there's a nice little dish of barley risotto. And really, that would take about 30 minutes from start to finish. Our pilaf. Not done yet. Need to see how our pilaf. Got it in the camera. Oh, there you go. Doing just fine. Okay, put the lid back on that. We want to cook that until all the liquid is absorbed. Every bit of it. Okay. Now, so I guess on the, uh, there we go. We're back to the stove. Uh, can we get a shot of the, did we do the finished risotto, Josh? We did, yes. It's on the cutting board. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, we did. Are okay. we back? We're back to the stove now. Oh, you see? Oh, I see it. Yes, I do. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the other camera and it's got the other picture on it. So, okay. Beautiful. So you see that. All right. So that's it. Mindy, you want to taste that? Of you course. want to tell us how delicious it is? Yeah. Here, wait, wait. Before you do that, I'll put the camera on. I'll put the camera on you. They can watch you choke. They heard me already, so I can't. Okay, there you go. She's actually eating it. Ooh. She gave it to my daughter and say, what do you think? You know, but it's good. It's delicious. The mushroom flavor, the chives, everything comes through. It does not look like oatmeal anymore. No. All right. Mm. So let's get rid of this. Okay. Broken. So I'm going back to the cutting already. board, guys. I didn't break one. I said we broke one. Oh, we broke one. Okay. Okay. So that's it for the cooking for the cooking part of the show. Any questions? We'll turn that off. Yep. No so questions question. so far. Are we done with the cooking board? You just said we're going back to the cooking board. No, I'm going to the cutting board. I'm okay. going back to the cutting board. So I just <laughs> wanted to. Uh, do we need any more light there? Like I maybe, don't think so. Like maybe bring that one over that way. As long as it doesn't give me a shadow. Okay. So, is there any questions on pilaf or risotto? We'll give that a stir. I'll let you know when they come in. Okay. And. All right, so as promised, uh, I am going to do a chicken then. So we talked about that. You know, chicken is, I think, one of the most common, probably the most common meat uh, consumed in the United States. Uh, and as long as you cook it and eat it, you know, properly, uh, it's very healthy for you. Uh, and just so you know, and I think Mindy will back me up on this, there's really not a whole lot of difference in modern chickens in the fat levels between dark meat and white meat. White meat chicken. is white meat is a still little leaner. Bit. Well, especially like now in turkey, there's a big, big difference. But in chicken, it's not quite as bad. But you know, definitely the I prefer the dark meat because it does it cooks better. Uh, it stays more moist, uh, and you want to make sure that uh, you know we don't like dried out chicken. Don't overcook it. It only has to reach 165 degrees for 20 seconds, okay? And I, I find it interesting. I read packages and recipes and hear things, and they're all talking about how you should cook chicken uh, to 180 degrees now. That's crazy. You're going to have nothing but rubber. The rubber is going to meet the road. Except if you cook the thighs to 180, you don't see the blood. No, no. Even though there's nothing. Sorry, to totally disagree with you. Disagree with okay. you. Fine. Don't cook them to 180 degrees. You don't need to. If you have a little bit of bloody bone, that's okay. That's typically natural. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean the meat is undercooked. It is still safe to eat. And if you are cooking a whole chicken, then the breast meat is going to be absolutely terrible. It's just like absolutely. the turkey. If you cook a turkey to 180 degrees whole, that breast meat is going to be inedible. Okay. Now, 
let's talk about the chicken for a minute. So I bought a free range whole chicken. I, I left it in the package because I wanted to see some things on here. Uh, so you may understand uh, when you do buy chicken, you do want to buy good chicken. You don't have to buy $10 a pound chicken. Um, there's the new, there's stuff that is air, air chilled, which is great because it's basically no. very little water retained in it because this chicken and most other chickens are chilled with ice and ice water after they're slaughtered. And then they do absorb some of the uh, moisture. But typically it'll say right on here though, may contain up to 6% retained water. That is legal. Anything over that 6% doesn't say it does, it may contain up to 6%. That, anything over that, they then have to call it a water added product. Okay, so you'll see that a lot in hams, water added ham, and that may have like six to 10 or 12% water, uh, a lot of moisture you know, added to it, makes it, especially if you use it for sandwiches. And then beyond that 15% limit, that becomes a, uh, in ham, is ham and water, or chicken and water, not uh, product, okay? Not water added, is chicken and water, ham and water. Uh, because it's now really, that's the ones that you throw on a pan to heat up and it shrinks, you know, a nice big slab of the ham uh, cooks down to a piece of bacon uh, because it's got so much water and it all cooks away. So, but when you buy the cheaper chicken, and I'm saying it's necessarily bad, but notice this one is just has water, nothing else. Uh, a lot of them will have water and salt. And that's when they pump the chickens with saline. One, that is there for two reasons. One, it's cheaper, okay? You're buying salt water instead of chicken. Uh, two, uh, the salt water is retained in the product when you cook it, so it's almost impossible to overcook the chicken. You do take it up to 180 degrees, like some people say, uh, it's still gonna be moist. That was originally developed for restaurants and stuff, and such where they you know don't want to overcook chicken but they want a less expensive and those uh, chicken and water products are less expensive so anyways I the other must thing to look at on the label real quick it says no antibiotics ever right that's true of all chickens now if you look when you buy it it'll say um oh. rosemary is used to as an antibacterial in the products because they don't feed them hormones they don't feed them antibiotics Okay, and that's because it's illegal. As it says right here underneath the water, federal regulations prohibit the use of hormones or steroids in poultry. So, you know, you don't, it used to be, yes, they were full of steroids, full of hormones. That's how they got those big giant breasts and everything, but they don't do that anymore. In any chicken, cheap chicken or expensive chicken, it can't have it. Now this one's free range, which means the chicken's allowed to wander. Now that's, don't think of it like a cow out in the pastures uh, because that's not typically how they do it, but they are not kept in tight little cages. They're allowed to walk around, okay? And this is an American chicken, okay? Which is nice to know. Uh, no nutritionals are on the front, but if this is one of those, have one of the saline waters in it, the sodium would be much higher than the 80 milligrams, okay? So let, it, let me move on. Now, I'm gonna go break the wrapper here in the sink. And this is done. Okay, you want it dry. it's done. Okay. You want it very dry. What? You have to let it cook a little bit longer. What are we talking about? The peel off of the risotto. Peel off. Uh, no, it does not need to be totally dry. We want a little bit of moisture. And I guess you can take it off the heat. And like any rice, uh, it will continue uh, to cook. Give it, you fluff it up with the spatula. What you want to do, you want to let it, you know, stir it and let a lot of the steam out. Now I want to see if this has, see this has no giblets. Is that part of the giblets may be missing? Yeah, because they didn't give you any, all right? Now, I'm going to bring this right to my cutting board and you're going to say, chef, why aren't you washing the chicken? And I'm going to say, because you shouldn't wash the chicken. And that is now recommended by the USDA and the FDA uh, that you do not wash chickens because what happens in the small, home kitchen is you tend to splash and you, you contaminate other areas of your kitchen. And then, you know, you don't know it, but you splash some, you know, salmonella 
onto over. your lettuce or onto the counter or maybe onto your sponges and then they're contaminated and then you know all you know when you cook a chicken properly you don't have to worry about the bugs that's why we take it up to 165 for 20 seconds it destroys 99.99 percent of all living bacteria so it's safe to eat okay okay Enough can you get the chicken one. a little bit more in frame for us okay uh just push yeah. it away from you slightly. There you yep, go. Right there you there. go. Okay. All right. Now, nice whole chicken. Got two wings. Got two legs. He Lots likes to dance. Back. This is a nice thing to do, by the way. Uh, I like to When you want to cut chickens up, if you're going to break it down yourself, there's an old trick is to give it a massage, but especially work it and give it a workout, and that loosens the joints and makes them easier to cut. Okay. It has arthritis after sitting in the package for so long. Yes, sure. Now, all you need, you only need one tool in order to break down a chicken, and that is a sharp knife, okay? Doesn't matter what kind of knife. Now, this is a bony knife, so we're pulling off this leaf fat, which we don't really need. Um, but just needs to be sharp. I can break this down with my bony knife. I can use my chef's knife, I can use my santoku, I can use my paring knife. I don't care, as long as it's sharp, that's all I need to know, okay? So anything, whatever your sharpest sharpest knife in the box that you have, okay? And make sure you have a knife sharpener so you can sharpen your knives. Okay, so when when you're going to break down a chicken, you can just take the paper away, I don't need the paper anymore, wash this. Uh, first thing you wanna do is remove the wings, all right? We're gonna inspect it, look at it, it's a nice looking chicken. Uh, if you're going to spatchcock this uh, for uh, the grill, you basically just flip it over spat. I'm, thank you. You're welcome. Spatchcocking is where you remove the backbone, which is here, typically done with a good pair of kitchen shears. Just remove that, spread it open, flatten it out, and that's a spatchcock chicken, which makes it cook really fast on the grill. Uh, and you also get the cooking flavor of the inside uh, as well as the outside. And it's a great way to, to do chicken. See, there, as you can tell, there's the backbone where the neck was, right down the back. But we're going to do that differently. So with all that loosening, you can feel where the joint is. Now, one nice thing to do when you are breaking down a chicken, uh, and you're doing uh, what we call an eight-way, we can do eight, nine, or ten pieces out of this. But you want to try coming from the uh, inside of the wing, just cut. And see, when I do that, I pull it away. It just automatically separates at the joint. Okay, see how easy that came? But then, don't just cut straight down and cut that wing off. If you're feeding a family, you know, a lot of people like wings, but you want to give them a little meat. So take the knife, come around the back, and put a nice piece of meat on that wing, see? Now, doesn't that have to be a lot more enjoyable? Now, you can take the wing tip off if you want. Uh, just with your knife and just cut through and break that little baby right off. Those aren't real well, but some people like to chew on those too, but that's typically where the feathers are and such. So we don't want those. Now I'm not on my cutting board, so I can't smack it. Okay. So, but there's a nice wing with a piece of meat on it. Same thing on the other side. Okay. We go from the inside, cut, bend with my wrist. You see that? See how that joint just came right apart for me? And cut, cut right around and get a nice piece of meat with that as well, okay? There we go. We'll leave that one with the, the wing tip on it. Okay, wings are off. Next, we go for the legs, okay? Same basic process. You're gonna go on the inside and you're gonna cut between the leg and the breast. See how simple, I'm not even pushing. See my knife's doing all the work. Okay, now once again, cut, use your wrist, bend back. You can feel it in here, the leg, the leg joint, see right there, pops right out, separate it, cut through. You have a lovely leg and thigh. Same thing all over again. I'm left-handed, makes it a little bit harder for maybe for you to see. Next time we'll try to set this up on the other side. So again, take my finger underneath, pop. See, there goes that, that joint. 
And if you're really good, you come around the back. It's right here is that oyster. If you can get that oyster with the leg, that's a lucky person that gets that oyster. Now, how do we cut the leg and the thigh? That's everybody, you know, always, what do we do? Where, how do we find that joint? Well, let's look at it. Pull that skin back a little bit. And notice there's a, a line of fat right here, okay? That's your, that's your cut line. Just follow that cut. Look at that. My knife went right through. Didn't even have to look for it. I got a perfect drumstick and a perfect thigh. See that? Okay, show us that right. fat line uh, toward the camera. Flip that around. There you go. And then point at it. Okay. See right there? There's that fat line. So I pulled back the skin from the other side of the leg and thigh, just a little bit. There's that line of fat that runs right between the thigh and the leg, right there. So all we've got to do is take our knife, just draw right through there, and look at that. We have a beautiful drumstick and a beautiful thigh. Now we can trim away some of the skin if we wish. Uh, you know, the skin is where a lot of the fat is. Mindy would say, just do this, say goodbye. Like you remember about boneless thighs, you know, except for the breast. We're going to leave that on, but we lost a lot of the skin to the breast. So, okay, now we have the breast. All right, let's push this up here. Now I can do this two ways. Oven's open. Okay, I can do it right on the carcass, or I can remove my, my backbone at this point and just have the breast, uh, which does, if I'm going to do a boneless, uh, does make it easier. So typically, we're just going to cut right here. Got that fat line again. We're going to follow that line, cut right down, cut to the back. Same thing on the other side. See, here's that fat line. We're going to follow that fat line. Your knife will cut right through. You have a good knife, whatever bone is there. You can then Bend your breast, bend this back. Because you've got the, the wishbone here. Now, technically, if I was in culinary school or a competition, I would have removed that wishbone first. But that's a little more complicated, and you guys don't really need to deal with that. All right, so there's my back. What am I going to do with that? Well, I can either cook it. Here's those the best pieces of the chicken right there. These are called the oysters. I can the juiciest remove, part. They're the most tender little. They're the small of the back, basically. Really, really good. If you're going to throw this in your stock pot, cut those off first and enjoy them. That's the cook's portion. Okay. So there's our back. Now, if I'm going to do a bone in, I would just cut right down and split the breast bone, the keel bone. It's very soft and cut right through it and have two bone in breast. Okay. And that's easy. Or I could you do that. Cook that whole. I could cook this whole like this. This would be a nice meal. As Mindy said, you could roast this whole or grill it and then carve it like a small turkey at the table. Okay. But let's say we want to make it boneless. Okay. To make it, you know, bone in, we just uh, take, uh, just split it in half. So really simple. Right here at the base of the keel bone is another bone, uh, is the bottom of the breast bone. I think a lot of us have had our surgeries, know where that is, okay? By the ribs at the very bottom where they, you got that little knot now in your chest. If you've had a dissection, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Here, hold away some of that fat. There we go. So you just take your knife and you cut through that, see? Real easy, cut it. See, I made a little cut there. Then I can spread the chicken, take my thumb, up. Take my thumb and just pop this little baby right out. See, this comes right out. There's the base of the keel bone. And then we've got the other piece up top that again pulls right out. So now I've got two actually bone in chicken breasts. So I can just split those. Now, if I was Kentucky Fried Chicken, I would take these two breasts and make this eight-way and nine-way. I would cut right here or make it a little angle and 
do a nine piece chicken, cut the breast into the three. And these are really big, so you could make this into three or even by separating it. I can then take my chef's knife and cut through the ribs and actually cut this into two portions. And that's plenty. These are plenty big to serve you know, each one of these two people. So there's our eight way chicken. All done. Now that's bone in, ready for the grill, ready to go, or the oven. Uh, package any way you like it. Now, if you want to uh, bone this out and have a boneless breast, you can almost see, you just got to follow things. So you see, we got the rib cage here. Take this bony knife, stick it underneath, and just cut away. See? Very simple. And what are we going to do with those bones? These are Does all. Everyone bones. remember? We have a bag in our freezer. We throw it in the freezer to okay. have it ready for stock. So just follow the bone line with your bony knife and cut that out. See? Gone. I see this is that uh, wishbone I was talking about. That's the one side of the wishbone. There we go. I now have a boneless breast. I now have a boneless, skinless chicken breast. just like in the grocery store. Look at that beauty, okay? So again, to show you one more time, so I'm a lefty, I'm gonna cross over on this. Unless Mindy, you wanna do it. I'll let you do it. Stick your knife Put underneath the ribs, point it up a little bit so you don't cut the meat, just cut the bones away, separate them, okay? You can take your knife, I'm doing it nice and slow. Just remember to and cut just... away from you, Okay. very important. Okay, and that's it. See, we just cut that, cut that, cut. And I think there's a piece of that. Yep, we still have our, our wishbone. We're going to remove that. And we'll get it out of there eventually. There we go. Crab, who used to make the chicken where they took the wishbone out? So it was. I used to do that. No, but it was we the turkey where they took the wishbone off and then all the meat fell that, off. That's, well, that's part of a carving technique uh, that if you do with a, a turkey, there is a way to get in there uh, when the turkey is raw like this and whole and just remove the wishbone only and then cook it. And I do it actually after it's cooked too. If you remove the wishbone first, then you make that slice down the breast bone and all of the meat just falls off because it's the wishbone that holds the two lobes of the breast together onto the rest of the, to the rib cage. So if you remove that, they all, when you make that first cut, they just come right away and fall off. Okay, so two boneless skinless chicken breasts. I've got my, my back or my stock pot or for, you know, some people like to. Wonder who. Yeah, wonder who likes to eat that. So we got. Whenever we had holidays. There's the. We had to cook two birds, no matter what type of bird we were cooking, whether it was chicken or turkey, because I gave one carcass to my mother and the other carcass to my mother-in-law. <laughs> okay, eight-way chicken and a with a back left over. Okay, and that's perfect. So there we go, as promised. Uh, next time, which will not be until the fall sometime, all right? We are, this is the done with the series for the spring. We're going to take the summer off. Mindy and I are going to be doing a lot of traveling um, over the next several months. Uh, if you, yes, we're good. So we're going to be, now, by the way, you got these nasty, dirty gloves. Uh, if you're not a healthcare person, let me just show you the quick way, the safe way to take them off. You turn the first pair inside out and then grab the other pair with the inside out glove. If I can get it. These are small. They fit my hands. Yes. And then pull and roll the other glove into that, and everything's inside out, no contamination, and into the trash. My hands are clean. Right on. So, we did have a clarifying question here. Uh, Melissa yes. was asking if uh, you could do the pilaf or the risotto with tabbouleh. Um, that's what I did. Bulgur. See, that's what I said. I said, yeah, he mentioned bulgur wheat in the beginning, and when he was listing off the grains he would work with, I'll double check here in a bit. Yes. Yep, yep. But bulgur, bulgur is tabbouleh grain. That's what you make. Now, they're different 
uh, sizes of bulgur. There's number one, number two. So there's coarse and there's finer. Uh, the, the real fine is really better for the uh, for uh, tabbouleh because it cooks. You basically just put hot water on it and let it sit. But uh, here is the pilaf uh, from the tabbouleh, and we can. Okay, hold on. And there you cutting board. Cutting board. Got it. All right, and uh, Molly jumps in to say, "Hey all." Hey, oh, chicken. Hello. Okay, I get to do the taste. I better like my own cooking. Mm. You know, it looks kind of pudding ish, but in your mouth, there's still plenty of texture from the bulgur. Mm -hmm. Well separated. The, let's tilt that toward the camera a little bit higher. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right there, right there. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yes, Dave won't have to stay in the bowl, but it definitely has, you know, separate grains. Um, I mean, the starch comes out. It's not like rice, but it's absolutely delicious. Not cracked. What? Oh, wheat? Yeah, yes. Cracked wheat. Yeah. This is cracked. Mm -hmm. We've done wheat berries. That's true. We have done wheat berries. Wheat berries are a great. That's another story. Read my my uh, white paper on that. Um, you can make a lot of great salads with wheat berries or throw them in soups and things. And that's just a whole wheat grain without um, untouched. So what did we grow in our yard? Was that wheat? That was wheat berries, <laughs> right. Wheat <laughs> berries are the, if you get them wet and allow them to sprout, that's where you get wheatgrass from that they use in the um, smoothie bars and stuff or wheatgrass juice. Uh, we I was using a lot of it at the culinary school, good story. <laughs> And I had a like a, I don't know, gallon of wheat berries that have been soaked. You have to soak them first, uh, just like a bean. And I brought them home, and we weren't going to couldn't eat them, and they started to sprout. So I put them so, in the backyard and yeah. grew grass. So they were yeah, <laughs> they were in a pan, and I noticed that the, I thought maybe the squirrels would eat them, and I put them out there, and the squirrels didn't touch it. So we just took them and threw them in the backyard in the grass. We had the greenest lawn. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> For about two three weeks before it all died off. <laughs> But it was so pretty for Florida. It was this beautiful, soft grass. I mean, if there were cows, they would have loved to come and eat it. Anyways, I don't want to take this on much longer. Our goal was to uh, try to do an hour. We've done an hour and 15 tonight, which I think is much more manageable uh, for everybody. Uh, and I appreciate if you have stayed all night. But as I said, Mindy and I will be taking off. Um, hopefully, well, we may do a kitchen. We're going to be up north in Michigan. Uh, for a couple of months of August and September, visiting our kids and grandkids. Um, we may do some programming up there, um, if possible. I'm sure it is. Oh, and then we're heading uh, to Europe. And we're going to do a, as, as those of you that are survivors like me, you know, you know, once I get there, I think I want to do the whole tour because, you know, we never know, right? That's, all, that's enough said. So uh, we're going to Greece. We're going to spend a week on a private yacht with, with 10 that only... Um, it's a sailing yacht that has uh, 10 passengers, and we're going to be on that for a week, sailing in the Aegean, uh, doing the Greek Isles. And then um, we don't know. Then after that, we don't know. We're just going to be wanderlust kids with our backpacks, you know, traveling around Europe like we used to, you know, in, in college days. So Otherwise known as wheeling bags now. <laughs> yeah, we'll be pulling our wheelies with us. Okay, I'm going to show you the, I did make the original granola. It's hot. Out here. <laughs> Okay, there. I got it. There you go. I think so. So that was the granola that I mixed up, tossed it, baked it for 15 minutes. Look at that. Nice, beautiful pieces. Hmm. Dessert. Okay. Any any more questions, comments? Uh well, we've got some comments. Uh Melissa's Please. asking about Ireland. We're gonna try to get there. We're gonna our last stop will tr will try to be the British Isles. Okay. And fly home from London. So we're planning on visiting Katrina <clears throat> up in Ireland. Right on, right on. Uh, Molly says, uh, love the travel non-plans. Yep, you, you can appreciate that. Supposedly, I, I have no penalty changeable tickets. Uh, we'll talk about that, Molly, because <laughs> we're, we're going to fly to Athens, and then I'm, I want to cancel from there and then just book the return. I've already bought round tip trip. But I'm just going to, you know, redo the return leg 
and then we'll talk about it. I don't need to do that here. So, okay. So let's talk about Thursdays, Hangouts. Oh, Hangouts this Thursday, we will be there. Uh, then in the, uh, no, this week I will not be there. Melissa is hosting um, Hangouts uh, Thursday at two. Um, I will be indisposed. Um, I'm having my gallbladder removed, just in case you're ever curious, um, Thursday morning. So I won't be in much of a mood. Uh, or he'll be in a really good mood. Yeah, we'll one see. of the two. I'll probably, you know, just getting out of recovery. So um, Melissa's going to handle that for us. Uh, then the next week, and then we're going to go all summer. Uh, July 6th, uh, Melissa's typical first of the first week of the month uh, support group falls on July 4th. So we're, she's going to take the hangout on Thursday the 6th and use that for her support group. Okay, so we'll all be there. Um, but that's hopefully be the only week we don't have. And then we'll figure out what we're going to do uh, when we get to Europe. Um, if we can do them from there or I may show up and then hand it off because everybody in Hangout seems to know what to do already. They don't really need a moderator. Uh, it's just a great, it's like walking in and out of a party. So everybody has fun. Hey, uh, Molly yeah. says, take us with you into surgery. Exclamation point. <laughs> hey John. If they would, if if I was still working, I might have been able to sneak in. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a GoPro on my head and see if, and point it at my belly, see if they can, if, if they won't notice. <laughs> so basically, they said they're putting four holes in him, and then they're going to put a bag around the bladder, cut it off, and pull it out. <laughs> Laparoscopic. Oh, okay. So Quickly. now this has turned into surgery hangouts, and then yeah, right. roll into the hangouts <laughs> we were, maybe. We were cutting up chicken, so, so now we're we cutting could... up Rob. You know, <laughs> for the next step, right? Okay, so anybody else remember Aortic Hope uh, is, is, you know, is, we're part of that and a sponsor. Uh, go to their website, aortichope.org, or on this page too on YouTube, you can hit the donate button. And please, 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 I don't get any of that money. It Tell just goes to the organization uh, to help us pay for things like our YouTube channel and stuff. So uh, nobody gets paid. We all do this out of the uh, love of our heart for this organization and for others. So uh, there's nothing else I'm going to say for now. Bye. Hello. See you next year. As my dad said, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>